This video is brought to you by Brilliant. Find out more at the end of the video and find my promo discount link in the description. Japan, Suzuka, it's back. Sort of. Bit of an awkward Sunday all in all, wasn't it? But we avoided the full horrors of Belgium 2021 when we got no racing at all, unless you look at the official records, and we did in fact get half a race in the end. So I'm going to be really annoying now in this video and have a bit of a moan on two key issues, and you probably know what they're going to be. But first, big congratulations to Max Verstappen on winning the 2022 Drivers' Championship. And you can't say he didn't deserve it. He's been phenomenal all year long, extracting pace in ways his rivals just couldn't. And we are truly in the Max Verstappen era at the moment. Everyone is going to have to step it up in a big way if they're going to want to compete with him. And he did it in sensational style, absolutely wiping the floor with everyone else in terms of race pace. He seemed to find grip where others just couldn't. But it was a bit of a damp squib in terms of being able to celebrate that moment of claiming the championship partly due to it being won due to a Leclerc corner cut penalty and partly due to a lot of confusion over championship points. But we'll get to that in a second. Because firstly, we really have to discuss the recovery vehicle, the tractor, crane, truck, whatever you want to call it, being out on an active and dangerously wet track because no one was happy about it. So to set up the scene, the race began in wet conditions, all drivers were on intermediate tyres. And from the formation lap, it was clear the track was wet. The spray was high and thick, turning the air into an opaque, blinding fog. And the spray was kicked up from standing water. And standing water causes aquaplaning. Now aquaplaning is essentially when a car's tyres skim across the surface of the water like a boat instead of pushing through the water and gripping the actual tarmac below. The car loses all grip and all control. And that's what happened to Science on that one on the accelerating right-hander after the hairpin. He lost control, he hit the barrier, and he sent bits of debris and advertising across the track. The safety car was called so the FIA could neutralise the track and deal with the incident. Now, meanwhile, Pierre Gasly had started from the pit lane after a late rear wing change, so he was already a bit behind the pack, but then he collected some of the strewn barrier debris from Science's crash, so he had to pit again at the end of lap one. This meant he was way behind the safety car train and had to catch up, so his pace was faster than the other cars on the track. And in catching the safety car, he went past the scene of the accident where he found a recovery vehicle on the track dealing with Science's car. In fact, there was a marshal on track too. So here's the problem. You probably know I don't like recovery vehicles like tractors and cranes and such being out on the track while the cars are circulating nearby anyway, but I can generally cope if it's well controlled, as I'll get to. But here we had a track where we knew aquaplaning was a serious issue. People can easily make mistakes out there even at reduced speeds. Visibility was a nightmare, and you'd Come on, tell me this vehicle is easily visible before potentially being too late. So the chances of an F1 car losing control, going a bit wide, or plane just not seeing the truck and crashing into it were a lot higher than normal. And we've already had an accident with a truck at this very track, and at that time the truck was way deep into the gravel trap. This one was on the circuit. Now was Gasly going too fast? Yes, no question, and he was penalised for it. Under safety car conditions, under double yellows, under red flag conditions, and passing by scenes of accidents, you've got to slow down and drive responsibly. There's no question about that. But whether Gasly was going too fast or not is an entirely separate issue to whether the truck should have been there in the first place. F1 cars can still lose it at much lower speeds and still have nasty accidents at much lower speeds. A collision between a recovery vehicle and an F1 car is so dangerous because the low height of an F1 car and the high floor of a recovery vehicle mean a collision could result in devastating head injuries. This is one of the reasons we have halos on the car at all. But a halo isn't a be-all end-all solution. In fact, in the Bianchi incident investigation report from the FAA, that's the accident where Bianchi died from head injuries in a collision with a tractor, it says, quote, There is simply insufficient impact structure on an F1 car to absorb the energy of such an impact without either destroying the driver's survival cell or generating non-survivable decelerations. It is considered fundamentally wrong to try and make an impact between a racing car and a large and heavy vehicle survivable. It is imperative to prevent a car ever hitting the crane and or marshals working near it. Meaning, it is not feasible to hope to make collisions between F1 cars and recovery vehicles safe. The best thing, the most important thing you must do is eliminate the odds of a collision ever happening. And in the wet, in terrible visibility, it was too high. 
And look, it wasn't just Gasly that went past the truck because he was late to the safety car train. The whole train of cars went past it, extremely closely. And while the train was going much slower than Gasly, they weren't going slow. We already know that area is ripe for aquaplaning because that's why there was a crash there in the first place. So a safety car does not remove the chance of someone losing control. Especially with marshals working on the track, the risk isn't worth the haste. Okay, but look, I get it. You can't stop the race every time you need to recover a vehicle. Sometimes it's drier or the conditions are safer, but the risk is still there. So what do we do when we need these big, dangerous vehicles? In this case, I think it's clear what was needed was to stop the race before bringing the tractor out. That much should be obvious as they did indeed stop the race shortly afterwards. They should have just waited. But in a more general sense, I think this is a fair plan of action to step through. 1. Ask, do we need to stop the race first? If so, do. If not, 2. Neutralise the race completely. And by completely, I mean all cars need to be right behind the safety car, for reasons that will become clear in a sec. And on this point, I think it might be worth asking if we do need to start closing the pit lane during safety cars anyway. Uh, aside from safety, it does kind of mess with strategies and throws too much random luck around. But it also slows down the process of getting all the cars behind the safety car and then getting restarted again. Anyway, 3. Communicate to the drivers exactly where the recovery vehicle is going to be. Again, I need to ask why F1 doesn't yet have a system where race control can just speak to all of the drivers via radio to issue safety instructions. It happens in other sports and it's super useful and effective. Attention all drivers, there will be a recovery vehicle on track on the left hand side of turn 12. Keep right and drive with caution. Simple. 4. Only then do you bring out the tractor. 5. You then use the safety car and race control radio to control the pace and positioning through this zone. If the safety car needs to move at a snail's pace for one corner then so be it, and race control can tell the drivers. No weaving or sudden changes of speed between turns 11 and 13. Follow the safety car to the right of the track. Easy. Safe. The race keeps going. Also as a final point on this, I do kind of think these recovery vehicles need to be mandated to have flashing lights at a minimum brightness so they're at least as visible through the spray as F1 rain lights. I hope you think I'm not being overzealous on this, there's a way to get everything done safely and quickly and this was all rather shambolic and dangerous and we're all a bit grateful there wasn't an accident. And we'd be rightly furious and upset if there was. Now the second big topic of shambles was the race point situation and again I'll set the scene. So first of all, with four races and a sprint after this race giving a maximum of 112 points, Verstappen needed to leave Japan with a 112 points lead over Perez and Leclerc to secure the title. Now he already had 108 points over Leclerc, so he just needed 8 more points than him this round. So this was a potential championship deciding race, so of course everyone was keeping a close eye on the point situation. Secondly, once the race was red flagged after lap 1, we didn't get going again for over 2 hours, so we ended up with a time limited race of just over 40 minutes of running, so naturally we weren't going to get the whole 53 laps. But that's okay, we have a new system of points if a race is only partially completed. It was brought in after the Belgian race in 2021 ran for only two laps behind the safety car and then was awarded half points, something a lot of people thought was ridiculous. So, everyone, including the media and the teams and the official social media teams for a lot of F1's platforms, were working from this system whereby, if over two laps have been completed but less than 25% race distance is completed, which is 14 laps in Japan, the points are six for the winner and go down to one for fifth place. If we complete between 25 and 50% of the race, that's 14 to 26 laps, column two points are awarded, which is 13 points to one point for the top nine. And if we complete 50 to 75% of the race, which is 27 to 39 laps, then column three points are awarded with 19 for the winner down to one for 10th place. And if they do over 40 laps, then full points are awarded. So they completed the first two laps and we were in column one territory. They then got to 14 laps, we moved into column 2, and actually we did get all the way to 28 laps, moving past half distance, so column 3 points were expected. 19 for Max, 14 for Leclerc in second, that's only 5 points difference, not the 8 he needed, so no championship celebrations were had. But then Leclerc got a 5 second penalty and dropped to 3rd. Okay, but that's still just a gap of 7 points. Still not 8, no championship secured. But then came the bombshell, the FIA were rewarding full points for the race, something no one had been expecting. Max suddenly had a 10 point advantage over Leclerc and did secure the title. He only realised it when told while chilling in the cooldown room. Hardly the massive celebration we're used to seeing as the championship winner crosses the line and joins his team in raucous jubilation. So what happened? Well, the FIA were technically correct, which, as you know, is the best kind of correct. But also, the whole thing was extremely stupid. 
So why were they correct? It's because the rules stated that these columns of points for partially finished races only apply to races that are stopped prematurely. All of these points refer to the suspension of a race through red flags due to dangerous situations. They don't apply to races which start so late they become timed races. There's this three hour window to fit the race into and if you start the race over two hours late, naturally you don't fit all the laps in. In this case, the FAA considers the race to have been brought to a stop naturally with a normal checkered flag. Which I guess is true, but it's stupid. Why? Because the whole reason these point strata were brought in was because everyone said it was ridiculous to give drivers half points for just two laps of racing, as happened in Belgium. So in theory, this doesn't solve the problem at all, because you could just start the race with five minutes before the time runs out, get two laps in, award full points. Incredible. The FAA managed to construct a regulation that fails to solve the problem they were trying to solve, that is, scaling the points to the length of the race. And the second reason it was all very silly is that it wasn't communicated properly. The media, the commentators, the journalists, the teams, the drivers, even Max Verstappen himself were all going off the assumption that we'd use this partial point system. And if that's happened, then there's definitely been a failure of communication. Yes, F1 briefly flashed up the points breakdown on the timing tower partway through the race, but here's the thing. F1 often accidentally flashes up incorrect information on the timing tower. It happens, they're not perfect, so we assumed it was just an error that they hadn't updated the system to reflect the new points. What they needed to do was put a proper message on the screen or on the timing computers confirming that full points would be awarded so everyone knew that when we crossed the line and when Leclerc got penalised, exactly what that meant. So the team could celebrate, so the fans could celebrate. Or commiserate, I guess, if you're Leclerc fans. Instead, what we got to watch was a bunch of professional F1 teams and journalists wandering around asking, did Max win? I don't know, did he? It says he did, but I don't think he did. What's going on? A little bit sad, really. But let's end this on a good note. It was an exciting race. It was very treacherous, but controlled once we actually got going. We saw the world champion drive like a world champion. We saw great battles, overtakes, defences. I think we all just wish it could have gone the whole distance. So congratulations to Max Verstappen once again. And now let's all take a breather before we do that final sprint to the finish line. And if you watch the Japanese Grand Prix, you might have spent a lot of time trying to do maths on the fly to try and work out all those championship permutations and how many laps we'd have left, which is where Brilliant may have helped develop those skills. Brilliant, as I'm sure you know, is a superb online learning platform that helps develop your skills and understanding in subjects across science, maths, engineering and technology. And Brilliant works by keeping you engaged with clear examples, visual storytelling and interactive problems. This means keeping subjects relatable, keeping problems approachable, and allowing you to engage with the topics and develop your understanding at your own pace. So if you've ever thought, I really wish I could be better at this stuff, but I just didn't get on with it, I'd recommend giving Brilliant a go. So if you saw the Japanese Grand Prix and want to go down Brilliant's mathematical learning path, you might be getting your head around everything from fractions, like fractional points that we might have got, probabilities, like the chances of rain clearing, and the kind of algebra that lets you play with accumulating different amounts, like maybe championship points. It's fun and will inspire you to keep on learning and getting stronger and stronger. Now to get started in empowering your knowledge with Brilliant for free, visit brilliant.org slash chainbear, which you can click in the description. Also, the first 200 of you to click that link will be able to get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. So thank you, Brilliant, 